All right, so here we go. This is the uh, I believe the 21st lecture then for uh, Thursday, the 16th of April. Um, we're almost done talking about galaxies, but there's one more aspect of galaxies then um, that I'd like to go over. And this is the idea then of active galaxies. If you remember when we talked about the Milky Way, we talked about the, the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, and we talked about how... Um, it, it doesn't put out a lot of, uh, of high energy radiation. It's not, it's not putting out um, a lot of energy. This idea then um, that our black hole at the center is sort of dormant and, you know, maybe every now and then, every few years, it eats something maybe about the size of a mountain or something like that and it flares up in the x-rays for a little while um, and goes quiet. And that's not the case, though, um, for all galaxies. I mean, there, there are other galaxies out there then that have much, much more energetic nuclei. And that's what we're going to talk about today then, this idea then of what are called active galaxies. And we really sort of found out about these in the, the 1950s with radio surveys. And they noticed then that some galaxies out there then are just incredibly luminous in radio wavelengths. And, and you know, hundreds of thousands of times more energy, um, um, hundreds of thousands of times more energy than, that the, than our entire galaxy is putting out then. Um, some of these galaxies then are emitting in the radio. And because of all of this energy that they're emitting, uh, people talked about these then as, uh, as active galaxies. And at the very, very start, you know, one of the debates was um, whether or not we're looking at something in our galaxy, um, something close by, or are we looking at things then that are far away, the same sort of thing. And given that they were distributed sort of uniformly in the sky, it was pretty obvious right away that these were things um, outside of our galaxy. And sort of what's shown um, here, um, these are sort of the brightest of the extragalactic um, radio sources um, here in the Milky Way. And, but they're, they're sort of different. I mean, if you think about in a normal galaxy, it's a collection of a few hundred billion stars, maybe even a trillion stars then. And the light that you see coming from that galaxy then, it's coming from stars. But in an active galaxy, it's different then. Um, most of the energy of the galaxy, most of the light from the galaxy then, is coming from the very, very center of the galaxy, the, the nucleus, um, or the, the in the case of maybe a spiral, then the bulge of the galaxy, or, or, or from the center. This doesn't mean there still aren't hundreds of billions of stars, or maybe even trillion stars surrounding this all emitting light, but what's coming from the center then, it's even more energy, it's even more light or radio waves or, or whatever that coming from the center of this galaxy, more than you're actually getting then from the stars. And, and they talked about this idea then as, you know, active galactic nucleus or nuclei, AGN. You'll hear astronomers talk about AGN. And so these are galaxies then whose nucleus, whose core then, is putting out, they're putting out tremendous amounts um, of energy. And they really sort of break down then um, into, into three sort of types then, um, depending on how they look. And they're, they're broken down then into Seifert galaxies, double-lobed radio galaxies, and, and quasars, which is actually a, a pretty old name then. And it turns out they didn't know it at the time, and this is sort of a theme hopefully you've been um, noticing throughout the course then, that people find things and they don't quite know what they are and they give them names and stuff. And it turns out then that maybe they're, they're actually related to each other. And maybe you're just seeing different aspects um, of, a, of a very, very similar process. This is another one of those cases that they do seem um, to, be, to be generally related to each other. But we'll get to that um, at the end. And so I just want to start then by just talking about the three different types and um, a little bit about them then. So the Seifert galaxies then. Um, these are spiral galaxies. And you would look at it then, maybe in visible light, and you go, spiral galaxy. Yes, obvious. It's got spiral arms and the whole thing. It looks just like a spiral galaxy. But the, the nucleus, the center of that spiral galaxy is extremely bright when you look in the radios or the x-rays then. And just uh, you can have almost a hundred times more energy then emitted by the entire Milky Way then coming from just the nucleus then of one of these uh, Seifert galaxies. And again, though, it tends to be in the radio or the x-rays or something like that. You don't look at them and go, oh, look at all that light from the nucleus. Um, it, it's, it, it's at different wavelengths. And these are about 
ten percent, um, or sorry, no, two percent of uh, of all the spiral the, uh, galaxies then that are out there. And you watch these then, and they're oh, here we go. There's the slide. The two percent then. Um, and yeah, okay, the nucleus emits in about hundred times out of the Milky Way. And again, in radio and X-ray then, and wavelengths and other than visible light. And you watch these oh. And the output varies. It's not just a constant brightness, and sometimes it's brighter, sometimes it's dimmer. And, and you watch the brightness change. And the brightnesses can change then, though, just in the matter of a few minutes. It can go from really bright to, to fainter, and then back bright again just over the course of a few minutes. And if you remember when we were talking about the, the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, and this idea that an object can change its brightness um, no quicker than the amount of time it takes to, for light to travel across it. So if you've got something then that changes its brightness over the course of an hour, um, the smallest it can be is roughly one light hour across. Or in the case of this then, um, you've got these things that are, that are changing their brightness and just over the course of a couple minutes, this means, um, I shouldn't say the smallest, the biggest it can be um, is, uh, is a, a, a light I forgot my example. If something changes its brightness over the course of an hour, you can tell it's been a long day. Um, if something changes its brightness over the course of an hour, the biggest it can be then is one light hour across. I got that backwards. And if you're, if you're thinking then about these Seifert galaxies and you're watching their brightness change over just the course of a, a few minutes, the biggest, the area then that's emitting these x-rays or these radio waves, the biggest it can be is just a few light minutes across. So um, if you think about it then, you know, one astronomical unit, this, uh, the radius of our orbit is about one light or eight light minutes um, wide. And so um, you've got something then that's basically got a radius then, if it can change its brightness then um, over the course of just, you know, a few minutes, you've got something then that's actually smaller um, than the Earth's orbit. And you've got a tremendous amount of energy though, uh, hundreds of times the, the energy of the Milky Way then coming out of an area then that's of order a few light minutes or of order, you know, one Earth radius um, going around the sun. Um, in size. And, and you can sort of see where this is going then. We've got a tremendous amount of energy then released in a very, 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 very small area. Um, and so um, Seifert galaxies, these are some images then um, of Seifert galaxies, a closer look at them then um, from, from Hubble's, uh, Hubble Space Telescope. And you can see like in 4329 here, um, here's the nucleus then, and you're seeing it, you know, just sort of behind this, you can see the, the disk and the, the dust in the disk, then you can sort of see that nucleus uh, peeking out here in 1019 and which one, 64, uh, sorry, 74, 69. You actually sort of see what almost might be, certainly in, in 1019, then, a sort of bright ring of, uh, of star formation. Um, and these are again optical images, but again, even in the optical, these nuclei are really, really bright. Um, in 3516, um, we've got sort of a bunch of dust structure here. Um, but these are, these are clearly spiral galaxies. I could have shown you these last week and you would look at them and go, yes, those are spiral galaxies. But the light we're seeing here then um, isn't coming um, from stars. It's actually coming then um, from ionized gas. And um, gosh, okay. Um, well, when do we get ionization? Well, we can get hot stars if we've got O and B stars um, that, are, that are ionizing some hydrogen. They can kick the electrons off, and when the electrons recombine, they come back down. That's what's up with, a, with an H2 region. But, but this is a little bit different then. Um, and so this is sort of, I know this is a plotty thing, but this is sort of what the light then from a regular galaxy looks like. And we've got a plot here then. This is the wavelength we're looking at then. This is how much light we're getting. And we see these little dips in the amount of light here from different atoms and molecules then. Um, this is a dip then caused by absorption by magnesium atoms. This is the, the dip um, caused then by ionized sodium. This is a dip then caused by absorption by the C H molecule. Here are two dips in um, absorption lines caused by um, ionized calcium, and here's some more ionized calcium. Um, and 
these dips in light then, well, it's an absorption spectrum, and that's because in a typical galaxy, the light that you see is the light from stars, and it's a, it's a, com, you know, a mixture then of the light from all the stars in the galaxy. These are all absorption spectra. And yeah, so you see an absorption then spectrum then um, from a typical galaxy. With the exception of this little sort of peak here then, um, this is actual emission then from the hydrogen. Um, these are actually being caused by electrons jumping from the third to the second energy level down. This is our lovely red H alpha or pink H alpha line here, and that's just a signal that um, of star formation. So you get a little emission sort of right here, but mostly absorption lines. You can compare that then to a Seifert galaxy, and this is a little bit bigger on the wavelength scale. We're going down into the ultraviolet here, but also again, this is a plot then of the the. Um, brightness versus the wavelength we're looking at, and this is logarithmic. So the difference between here and here, then this much, it's a factor of 10 in brightness. And we see all of these emission features here, then, like uh, this is doubly ionized oxygen, here's uh, ionized helium, here's doubly ionized oxygen, doubly ionized neon, ionized oxygen, quadruple ionized neon, ionized magnesium, double ionized uh, carbon, here's, uh, oh, that's a carbon three or a triple ionized carbon right there. We see these emission lines then, and we see them then from heavily um, ionized atoms. And not just a hydrogen atom that's been ionized. And this is stuff like, you know, here's neon then, and it's missing four electrons. Holy moly, that's it. You need a lot of energy to knock four electrons off neon. And so we're seeing, we're seeing ionization, and we're also seeing a lot of ionization, and we're seeing the emission lines then as those electrons jump back down and recombine and give off that light. But this is telling you then that at least in the nucleus where this light is coming from, um, we're seeing extremely, extremely hot um, hot gas, you know, million, like 100 million degree Kelvin gas. This is super hot gas. And also, though, if you look at the emission lines then, um, they're not super sharp. Like this, this ionized magnesium line here, it's a very, very wide line. So some of the light from this ionized magnesium then kind of blue, some of the light from the ionized magnesium kind of red, and we've got this lovely wide line here where some of this light then that's being emitted is too blue, some of this light that's being emitted is too red. Look at the width of this thing then, tons of extra blue light and extra red light. How do you explain that? Oh, those are Doppler shifts. If we've got this gas and it's not only emitting, but it's rotating, the gas then that's emitting these lines and moving towards me, all of those lines will be too blue. The gas that's moving away from me then, all of those lines will be too red. And you can take a spectral line that should be all emitting at one wavelength, and it just gets spread out. We've got some of the emission then that's too red, some of the emission that's too blue from the side that's moving away from you, from the side that's moving towards you. It makes those spectral lines look broader. And so we've got then signatures of rotation then of this gas moving at really, really fast speeds, like 10,000 kilometers per second. So we've got in very, very high temperatures. We've got rotation. It's all coming from a very, very small space. Um, and, and so sort of in summary then, you see then, they're bright in the x-rays. They're bright in the radio. Where all this is coming from, it's very, very small, very, very hot, a lot of very, very fast rotation. And um, yeah, it sounds like a black hole to me. And that's one of the ideas then behind these Seifert galaxies then, that we're looking then at galaxies that have supermassive black holes at their center, just like the Milky Way does, but they're active. You've actually got stuff then falling into the black hole. And remember then, as, as stuff falls into the black hole, you've got a tremendous amount of gravitational re uh, energy then being released. This idea then, if I walked up to you know the black hole at the center of our galaxy and I threw an apple in, the energy released by that apple, just the gravitational energy released by that apple falling into the black hole would be more energy than the, than the nuclear weapons that were dropped in, or sorry, the atomic weapons um, that were dropped in World War II all combined together and just from that apple falling into the black hole. And so this idea then that these are, these are spiral galaxies just like our Milky Way with supermassive black holes 
in their, in their centers, just like our Milky Way, but these galaxies have stuff falling into those black holes, which is then um, releasing energy. And the idea then is, you know, well, why don't we see all spiral galaxies doing this? Why isn't the Milky Way then um, a Seifert galaxies? And, and the idea then is, you know, 25% of the Seifert galaxies that we see um, have sort of odd shapes or other evidence then of, of interaction interactions. And we also see Seifert galaxies then they're more common um, with interacting galaxy pairs then um, than they are with isolated galaxies. And this idea then that you can have two spiral galaxies or a spiral galaxy with a central black hole and some other other galaxy interacting with it and the gravity then, the tidal interaction between those two galaxies can end up then kicking some of the stuff then um, into the black hole. And then it swirls down the drain, it superheats, you get all this gravitational energy then, a lot of it's converted into heat, into high energy radiation, and the next thing you know then, the whole nucleus, the whole black hole, that small spot in the center of the, the, the nucleus of those, those galaxies then just lights up from the stuff falling into the black hole. Um, and so, you know, for all we know, um, when we interact with Andromeda then, four billion years from now, Andromeda's gravity then is going to change the orbits of some of that stuff then near, near the center of the Milky Way then. It's going to end up falling into our black hole and distant astronomers on some other galaxy might be looking then, you know, at the Milky Way going, ooh, Seifert galaxy, as stuff falls into to our black hole. All right, so um, we've got that. Another example, then, of an active galaxy, though, is these double-lobed radio sources, which are really, um, really sort of weird. Oh, I don't want to say weird, but, but we didn't, again, see these until we had radio telescopes. It really sort of came online in the, the 1950s, and people started doing these radio surveys, and they saw things like this, then, where you've got, then, these, these two spots then that are glowing very very bright in the radio and this is a this is a radio image that's been been um sort of colorized here and these these things are huge then i mean you talk about then um the scale of these things you're, you're measuring some of the largest ones in megaparsecs and millions of light years then um these enormous um radio lobes and what they found, though, was when they did optical, oh, there we go, when they did sort of optical follow-ups, and typically in the center of these things, um, they would tend to find um, sort of galaxies in here. And um, unlike the, the Seifert galaxies, though, that emit light from the nucleus, then most of the energy then from these double-lobed radio, or these double-lobed uh, radio sources, radio galaxies, then, is being emitted then by the, the sort of two lobes. And um, gosh, what to say about these? Um, they, they can be even larger than a, than a galaxy cluster. I mean, the idea then is, is you've got one of these, you find then at the very, very center then is a small, compact, active galaxy, and something in that galaxy then is basically just squirting, um, squirting jets on the side of it. I don't know how to say, a, I don't know how to say about anything. How it's basically fast, high energy material then uh, being squirted out of the center of this galaxy. Then you find a lot of synchrotron radiation and these, these lobes then these jets go out, they interact with the intergalactic medium, sort of heat it up and you get then these, these giant um, radio lobes then caused by this material. Um, and so um, you, you can even see sort of hot spots in the jets where they're hitting clumps then of material then in the intergalactic medium then, and they're slamming into it, and you get then um, these hot spots. Um, all right, so, and so, uh, yeah, so the idea behind this then is, um, they call this then sort of the double exhaust model, where you've got then some source, some um, galaxy then with a, a compact source then, and it's just squirting the material out of, out of either side then. Um, well, yeah, I'm just going to leave it at the uh, at the, the double exhaust model. That sort of speaks for itself then. Um, and you can tell I'm having trouble with this because we don't... We don't really know exactly what's going on here, what the actual cause is. But we've seen this before um, when we've talked about black holes. And you've got a black hole, you've got the material falling into the black hole, and it basically forms a disk as it's spiraling into the black hole with the conservation of angular momentum um, and all of that. And this tremendous heating and this tremendous um, emission then of high energy, you know, X-rays and sometimes even gamma rays as it's falling in into the black holes. And one of the things that sometimes happens, though, is you'll get 
uh, an accretion source like a black hole, you'll get the stuff falling in, but you'll also then get jets of material then perpendicular to the plane of, uh, of, the, uh, of the disk then, um, basically jetting out the top and bottom. And, and the actual mechanism behind that really, really um, isn't, um, isn't well understood. But when you see them sort of twisted, um, you can, you know, the idea then is it's, it's basically something falling into a black hole. At the core of this end, you see what might, what looks like maybe a very small, tiny interacting galaxy, something like that. You've got a black hole, you've got material falling into the black hole. It's forming this disk as it spirals in. But for some reason, perhaps uh, something with a tangled magnetic field, something like that, uh, kind of like what happens with our solar flares, you get then the material squirting out in jets. And I, I wish I had more, I wish I had a better explanation than this one. It's, it's always frustrating then to talk about these idea, this idea then of these disks and with jets squirting out the, the top and the bottom. We also saw this with star formation too. Um, if you look at the Herbig Harrow objects, go back and look at those, you would have a disk forming a star at the center, but you would also get material ejected then perpendicular um, to the plane in the of the disk. And that's just poorly understood. But what we do know, though, um, is that this is probably associated with a black hole with a disk around it that's just squirting the stuff out, high energy, uh, high energy material, out the, out the top and the bottom. The last type of active gal galactic nucleus then, or, or active galaxy, I should say, the last type of active galaxy to talk about then would be the quasars, the quasi-stellar objects. And these, again, were first found with radio telescopes. And in the radio then, they just looked like point sources. They looked, just looked like stars. But they had problems then when they went to try and find one. It just looked like a, a, a normal star, or there was nothing there whatsoever. And so this is an image then of 3C273 um, right here. And, you know, I could probably convince you that's a star. It certainly doesn't look like a galaxy. Um, and, and so that's where they sort of got their name. Quasar then comes from, the name comes from quasi-stellar objects, or QSOs then. And they're, they're tremendous radio sources, but they kind of look like stars, or sometimes you can't even find them at all. And... Um, what to say about this then. Um, uh, it, it wasn't clear really what they were. I mean, today, we, today we've got a pretty good idea then of what, what they are. And maybe I'll just jump to this. Um, and, and this was sort of the, the aha moment then, because this was, um, oh, come on, come on. Yes. This was, here's a spectrum then of, there we go. Here's the quasar 3C273. You grab your telescope then, you split the light up into its wavelengths then, and you see sort of something that looked like this. You've got a few very, very broad um, emission lines. Nobody knew what they were for a very, very long time. And it wasn't until, and I, I, I'm not quite happy with this picture because it gives it away, but it was in 1963 then that Martin Schmidt realize then that these lines that they were seeing are actually redshifted hydrogen lines, seriously redshifted hydrogen lines. And a couple of things about that. Once we realized that with these, these quasars then, um, the key to finding them then was just these highly redshifted hydrogen lines, they went back and it turns out there, some of these are even known uh, that don't even uh, have, uh, have strong radio emissions with them then, some of, these, some of these quasars. So sometimes they have radio emission, sometimes they don't. And um, the Doppler shifts though, um, were really crazy then. The Doppler shifts then, um, these Doppler shifts were more than what you'd expect just from um, doing the Doppler equation like we've, we've been using it in this class. And it turns out these are going so fast um, that you have to take into account relativity. And these, these redshifts then are incredibly large. And um, you talk about then the, the redshifts, when they get this, this large, you measure them in terms of Z. And um, if you go back to the last lecture, some of the redshifts we talked about with the Hubble law then, if you look back at those plots, they had a little Z measurement on the bottom, which I ignored. And that's because I didn't want to get into this until now. The redshifts then can be so big, um, how to say it, 
that if you didn't make the, the relativistic correction for them, um, you'd think they were moving away faster um, than the speed of light. But if you correct for that, if you correct for, for relativity, then um, it turns out these things, um, they're, they're not moving faster than the speed of light, um, but their redshift center huge. That made absolutely no sense. I'm going to have to do a, probably a better job on that in the next lecture, though. But, but this means, then, that these, these are huge redshifts that, that look like they're bigger than the speed of light, and, and they're not. You have to take into account relativity. But they also mean, then, if you're seeing redshifts this big, that these objects, then, are incredibly far away. They're at huge distances, then. And that also means, though, if we're seeing them, um, they also then have to be putting out a tremendous amount of light. And so a typical quasar, then, is putting out, you know, thousands of times more light than a normal galaxy is. And they're the most luminous type um, of active galaxy, because we can see them, then, from these extreme distances. And this also means that what we're seeing, then, um, is something that happened a long time ago, that these are objects then that were active, they were, they were doing this quasar thing very, very early um, in the universe's history. And that almost sort of starts to make sense, though, if you go back and think about these active galaxies then, and this idea that maybe there are interactions with other galaxies, and you've got these central black holes, and maybe stuff's being kicked into the black holes. If you go back in time, when the universe was smaller, the galaxies were basically, you know, uh, more dense, and they interacted with each other more often. And so maybe you might expect to see that through these interactions between these galaxies, more stuff being kicked into these black holes, lighting up then um, these galaxies. And again, um, just like what we talked about with uh, Seifert galaxies, you look at the variabilities of quasars, and here's the date here, and here's how bright uh, 1308 plus 326 is um, in magnitudes, and sure enough, then you see these variations, and these variations are happening over short time scales, like from here to here, it's just like maybe about a month or so, and so we see these variations on, on time scales of years, months, we actually even see them, um, if you look carefully then, time scales of hours, which are again telling you that these are very, very small objects and maybe about the size of the solar system. They're, they're emitting then thousands of times more light than our entire galaxy does from, from, a, from, a, from a very, very small space. Again, getting you thinking about the ideas then of black holes and that these are extremely um, active, uh, active galactic nuclei. And and we also then uh, think there's some evidence then of jets coming out of these things. It's just hard to find them then because they're so far away. But this, this all sort of makes sense then. It's a much more dense environment. You'd have much more stuff being kicked into the central black holes. The galaxies then would be a lot more um, active. And so the sort of idea, the connection then between all of these objects then, is they all produce x-rays and radio observations. They all seem to vary then on short time scales, meaning whatever's producing this material then um, is very, very small. A lot of them show evidence of jets then, the double-lobed galaxies, and you see jets then with the quasars. And all of these suggest that what's going on here are these galaxies with a central supermassive black hole that's got stuff being kicked into these, into these, into these black holes, forming that disk then where the stuff sort of spirals down into the into the drain. And the stuff's being kicked in just by gravitational interaction with neighbors through collisions or, or just even another galaxy passing by, which you're going to find in the galaxy clusters, which you're going to find then um, early um, in the history of the universe. And really what you're seeing then between the three different kinds is basically, you know, how much energy is being produced. Is this a quasar or is this a Seifert? And, and how are we actually seeing it? And that's, that's, it's painting with a broad brush, though. The details here, then, um, as you can tell, aren't really fully understood. But that's the basic idea. And if you think about it, you know, this sounds like a tremendous amount of stuff falling into these galaxies. It actually isn't that much. And again, talking about the idea of, you know, in order to see... Um, what we would for a quasar then, thousands of times the energy output of our Milky Way, you'd only need to throw about 10 solar masses uh, per year into that black hole in order to get that sort of energy output. Again, going back to that idea that, um, you know, you can, you can just throw an apple then into one of these things and you get like 80 uh, Hiroshima 
bombs um, out of it just from an apple then. So you don't need to throw a lot of mass into these things to power it. And here's sort of the idea though of what's going on where you've got then the central black hole, you've got the material spiraling into the black hole, then uh, conservation of angular momentum doesn't let it spiral, just it doesn't fall just straight directly into the black hole. Conservation of angular momentum is going to have it swirling in a disk like this. The friction, the gravi release of gravitational potential energy is going to heat it up to tremendous temperatures you're going to get all of these x-rays uh, produced by this. You'll also have magnetic field lines tangled in here producing the synchrotron radiation and through some sort of process we don't quite understand as the stuff gets close to the center, some of it ends up getting shot out of the top and bottom of the disk which is what's creating then those double lobed um, radio galaxies. But that's sort of our idea then um, of, of what's happening um, with all of this. And um, you know if you look then uh, super supermassive black holes then really you know they're not the dominant feature of a galaxy and, and you think about you know typically they're like a tenth the supermassive black hole that, that tenth the mass or a tenth of a percent the mass of the the surrounding bulge I mean look at our own galaxy the Milky Way then you're only talking about four million solar masses um, worth of stuff but but the process then of how these formed and, and what's going on here then it's really sort of poorly understood and some some ideas then are that the bulge and the black hole sort of form together where you've got then the bulge and you've got all this material coming together in a small space and maybe a couple of the stars supernova one of them forms a black hole stuff ends up because it's very very compact and squeezed in there stuff ends up falling into a black hole the, the black hole and maybe a black holes merge and you end up then building up the black hole in the bulge or with the bulge just because you know everything's in there sort of sort of close together other ideas though is maybe you start with the black hole and the the the, the sort of bulge forms around it, we're totally not clear then um, on, on what's going on with that. That's still a problem then. And so this is NGC 4261. Um, it's got a 400 million solar mass black hole. Um, and as near as we can tell, it's got an 800 light year diameter disk of material then um, that's feeding it. It's just an example then of one of these extraordinarily um, active, uh, active galactic nuclei. And again, there's a lot of work to do on this though, because we're not entirely sure what's going on. But this brings the chapter to a close. And I know um, Tuesday's lecture sort of seemed to go on for a long time. Um, and so because of that, I'm going to call this one um, right now a little short and use the rest of the time um, to study. We've got one lecture left then that'll just be about cosmology and the whole idea, how did all this get here and what's up with the universe. Um, so I will see you on Tuesday. Um, and again, if you have any questions, uh, come to my office hours, okay?